Hello everyone, I am Imro Ivan, and as the presenter of my group, the other members of which are Kubilay Shirk and Said Yasir Karaman, today I'm going to present the topic of how to be a good teacher. Alright now, first off, please have a brief look at the table of contents to have an outline of how the presentation looks like. As seen, there are seven main sections of the slideshow, and while going through the slides, I'll brief you about what each section includes before diving into their details. Now let's start with the first section. In this one we seek the answers to the very question asked in the title, what makes a good teacher? Of course we're not the first ones to ask this question, Jeremy Harmer, the author of the chapter in our course packs on which our presentation is based, also wanted some answers. Therefore he began his research with a tape machine by his side to record the spontaneous responses of the participants who were asked the same question. His aim was basically to shed light on their profoundly held beliefs about the features of a good teacher. The participants, as you can see on the right, comprised of English language teachers in the UK, Spain and Finland, as well as some teacher trainers, methodologists and a variety of ELT students of different backgrounds and levels. Based on their given responses, I've deemed it easier to present uh, the overall features of a good teacher by dividing them into three subcategories as the following, character and personality, relationship with students, and other desirable features. How a teacher's character and personality are shaped can directly influence the teaching and learning process. Some of these desirable character and personality traits in a good teacher total to five, as you can see on the slide. The first one is making the lessons interesting. Boredom is the nemesis of a great teaching methodology. In other words, we must keep our learners motivated throughout the lesson period as much as possible. And how can we achieve that? Games, music, filler activities, storytelling, role-playing, physical activities if their ages are appropriate and the like are some of the activity types we can utilize to keep the spirits up. Second one is loving the job. As in every other profession, the key to success in teaching is also loving the job. If a teacher enjoys his or her job, student's interest is automatically better maintained. Now imagine a grumpy teacher who always looks fed up and unhappy. And now imagine a teacher who even though feels emotionally horrible, puts on a happy teacher's face while entering the classroom. Which of them would you prefer? Is it the former who brings their private lives into the classroom? Or is it the latter who leaves everything aside as soon as they open the door? Third one is being sincere and showing your true self, showing your personality without going further into your private matters, as aforementioned, is a good idea to bond with your students. Since your learners tend to be interested in you to get familiar with you, showing real bits of yourself might help them achieve that. Being knowledgeable and cultured in general. Well, teachers should be knowledgeable, not only about their specialty and education, but also in different areas of life as well as being cultured, it is already stated in the general proficiencies of a teacher by the Ministry of National Education as well. I'm sure all of you have read it by now. For instance, your interests, hobbies, passions or life experiences are all sorts of things that you might want to share in the classroom within reasonable circumstances of course. Uh, you don't want to overdo it. In other words, do not try to make everything about yourself or you might bore your learners and make a fool of yourself. The last one is being an entertainer. The classroom is your playground and you are the actors, actresses, so play your roles as you will and try to make students as entertained and as amused as possible to keep their spirits and interests up but be careful so as not to let entertainment overwhelm the teaching and learning process, since entertainment is only an instrument to achieve learning. Balance things out. Coming to second subcategory, relationship with students. 
Well, it might have seemed that the personality and character traits uh, might be of prime concern, but the most important features of a good teacher are directly linked with how well established their relationship with students are. And this is only natural because we are sociable creatures seeking a safe environment with trustable, respectable and loving people in it. Take yourselves for example. Most probably you all had a teacher whom you didn't really like and who was a bit off in terms of social relationships. Did you like his or her lesson? I for one had a physics teacher just like that and my already low physics grades were terrible thanks to him. So pedagogically speaking, a positive environment and a good teacher-student relationship help our students better learn what we teach in contrast otherwise. Now, let's have a look and see the details. Having affinity with students. A good teacher is someone who can identify with the hopes, aspirations or hardships of their students just like a responsible parent. You feel happy when they are happy, you feel sad when they are sad, or you feel proud when they are also proud of themselves. That's how it goes. Empathize with your students. You gotta be one with them in every aspect as much as possible. Second one is being able to manage student interactions. Simply put, a good and an experienced teacher knows who the class clown, the shy one, the hard worker or the troublemaker is. In an ERT setting, as it should be in all the other lessons, a good teacher should be able to get the shyer students to talk more, while controlling the more talkative ones and thus getting all the students to have a nearly equal amount of participation rate in the course. The third one is knowing how to correct mistakes. I think this is one of those points about teaching English that we know the best and frequently come across in nearly all of our courses. Our corrections must not offend any of our students and should rarely be direct. In other words, indirectly and constructively done corrections are the best. For instance, a student pronounces the word buy in the sentence, let's say, I will buy some bananas as I will buy some bananas. Instead of straight saying that, he just said it wrong, and the correct form is this. He can just restate his sentence and say, So you will buy some bananas. I got you. See, it already got better. Fourth one is being familiar with students. The most simple thing you can do is to know their names. As simple as that. Humans love when they feel they are cared for, known, loved, and respected. Students are not an exception. In larger classes, I know that it might be far more difficult, but it's the effort that counts. There are also two more factors about relationship with students, and let's have a look. First one is being approachable. Your students should be able to talk to you when they have something in their minds bothering them or they have problems. You should be just like parents, but the only exception is that you will have an average number of 20 children. Remember that. I will keep repeating it throughout the slides. The last one is being helpful, not aggressive. Nobody likes teachers who shout too much, even other teachers. And this is not about discipline or teaching better. When a teacher shouts or gets aggressive, students have the chance of feeling anxious, panicked, or feeling that their time is being wasted. Instead, try and learn to manage classroom behavior and help those students in need, be it a psychological help or another. Our last subcategory is other desirable features. Well, these are some of the factors which I couldn't quite fit on the either former subcategory, so here they go. The first one is classroom management. It's an indispensable skill of a good teacher to be able to control, influence, and inspire the class. So, if you are an interesting and a good role model in the eyes of your students, your job gets better and easier. The second one is caring about the students. 
as you can also see in the chapters relevant page page 19 if you have your course packs open in front of you the authors of a research book named making sense of teaching gathered a group of good teachers chosen by their students to find out what made them good teachers and the most common feature of these teachers was that in responding to questions about their teaching in research their talk mostly always revolved around what their students were doing so a short answer to the question at hand what makes a good teacher is caring for the students learning process instead of what you are teaching how you are teaching it is the learning that matters not teaching the third one is having a dress sense well it's a bonus feature that i like very much in the chapter uttered by a 13 year old girl as you can see the teacher needs to have dress sense not always the same old wearing suits and ties well for one i really like suits and ties but she might be and is right and we will prove her point in the upcoming slides section two talking to students and this one we will have a brief look at how to talk to students in an appropriate manner using rough tuning how to adjust our speech and bodily movements to reinforce and accompany our verbal language and following those we will have a look at how to give instructions successfully and clearly before diving into rough tuning i, I want to say that in general the way in which teachers talk to students is an essential teacher skill it doesn't necessarily need any technical expertise but requires teachers to know their audiences and adjust their language in accord now rough tuning is what helps you achieve this it is the ability to adapt the language in various ways in compliance with the respondent of the speech parents do that quite often with their young children they use exaggerated tones of voice they build less complex grammar structures and they restrict their vocabulary to a certain degree what's more they try to maintain eye contact much more than normal and all these are done unconsciously let me tell you this teachers also do make use of this process unconsciously what did I say earlier on in this presentation? We're just like parents. The only difference is that we have at least 20 children. Don't forget this. Coming back to rough tuning, well, as clear as it is, we utilize it to make ourselves understood by the students listening to us. This rough tuning is done as a matter of course by the experienced teachers, whereas new buys <laughs> or newer ones might have to concentrate on student comprehension since we basically lack practical experience body language apart from adjusting our language experienced teachers also accompany their speech with various physical movements such as gestures expressions and mimics with practice of course showing feelings movement time sequences or abstract concepts like heavy, hard, or drunk, through the use of bodily movements becomes second nature and a part of the language teachers use, specifically while working with lower level students because they need uh, more rough tuning and they need more reinforced uh, meaning to be able to comprehend what is being said well 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 giving instructions no matter how great and fun your activity is supposed to be if you can't give and make your instructions clear the activity becomes a waste your students must understand what they need to do to do that to achieve that you should keep the instructions short simple and logical to help us with giving instructions clearly there are some questions that can be of help which I call instruction evaluators. First one is what is the important information I'm trying to convey? That is, what's the aim of this activity? What will your students learn from this? 
The second one is what must the students know if they are to complete this activity successfully? Simply put, this question seeks what the needed knowledge of the students are to finish the activity in the desired way. The last two questions, which information do they need first and which should come next? These explain themselves. Uh, you need to know how to organize your instructions before verbalizing them. And after giving them, you need to check if they are understood, which can be achieved either by asking a student to explain the activity or getting student to show his or her friends in the classroom how the activity works. Another way is having a student to translate the instructions into L1. If the classroom is in an EFL or ESL setting, Here's a short sample activity that we've prepared. Now let's see which instruction evaluators we have taken into consideration in writing this. What was our first evaluator? What's the important information I'm trying to convey? Well, we're trying to get students to plan the birthday party and act it out to practice the use of language here. Second evaluator was what must the students know? if they have to complete the activity successfully. As seen, they need to read the dialogue on the worksheet to have a clue about what the birthday party is, which information do they need first, and which should come next uh, were the last two evaluators. Well, this is basically the quote that follows, say, let's look at the first page, blah, 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 itself, and the sequence in which the instructions were given. In short, if these instructions look logically sequential to you and brief and simple as much as possible, they look and they are successfully clear. Section 3 Talk Times in Class is a relatively short section in which we have a look at TTT, Teacher Talk Time, and uh, Student Talking Time, STT. Well, there still is a debate about how much teachers should be talking in class, although the consensus about 15 minutes mostly comprising of instructions as we have already learned from our classroom management course. And in this regard, let's have a further look. Teacher trainees classes are sometimes criticized for having too much TTT while not having enough STT. Well, there might be a lesson for us future teacher trainees here. Try to keep a low profile in classroom as much as possible. Remember, we will not be a student anymore, but a teacher who wants the best for their students. So you allow your students to use the language. Well, we know that getting students to speak to use the target language is a crucial part of our job. It's a vital duty uh, and it is the students who need to practice the language, not us, the teachers. So, generally, a good teacher is someone who maximizes student talk time while minimizing their talk time. But, extraordinary circumstances might compel teachers to not be able to do so. Take the current pandemic, for example. Interaction is hardly two-way due to restrictions, so we are bound to stick with an increased amount of TTT. However, a good utilization of TTT also has its benefits, if teachers know how to rough tune their language to talk to students. Good utilization of TTT results in students getting a chance to receive comprehensible input, which is above their own proficiency level but can be somewhat understood, I plus one. Well, the second one is that receiving rough tuned input in a safe language learning environment facilitates language acquisition. But on the other hand, in a classroom where teacher's voice is heard every day without any student voice coming, it's also not desirable. TTT should not be overused. Likewise, a class in which the teacher is reluctant to speak is also not desirable. In conclusion, the best lessons are the ones where student talk times maximized, but where 
in appropriate points during the lesson, the teacher dives into the discussion, summarizes what they have done, tells a story, then wins up the class and the like. So balance is the key to everything. Section 4. The Charm of Unpredictability As I earlier stated, student boredom is the nemesis of successful teaching, a cause of which might be the predictability of the teacher and or the lesson. When students begin to frequently know what's going to happen in class, because the same things already happened all over again in the last classes, student interest and joy naturally die. Human mind loves a little bit of, be careful, I'm emphasizing this, a little bit of unpredictability to maintain interest and focus on the desired action or situation. And let's see what we can do to prevent predictability both in terms of teacher and in terms of lesson. Well, in terms of teacher, According to Fancelow's book, Breaking Rules, in our course packs, page 21, to maintain a good mentality in the classroom and keep students involved, we, teachers, need to break some rules. That is, we need to violate our own routine behavioral patterns. Remember the 13-year-old girl? The teacher needs to have dress sense, not always the same old boring suits and ties. Well, she is right, and we are now proving her right. Dress sense, in other words, if a teacher generally wears casual clothes, one day she should show up wearing a suit and tie. If she normally sits down, she should stand up in a class. If normally noisy, they should spend the class in a calm and slow manner. This way, by breaking a rule each time, a mixture of curiosity and surprise awakens the students, which creates a perfect starting point for student involvement. Why? Because students think, wow, what happened? Isn't it weird? What is going to happen now? Why does he act like that? Etc. Did you get the point? I think you got it. In terms of lesson, well, as is the case for a teacher, the lesson itself also must include the elements of surprise and variety, otherwise spending all the classroom time writing sentences or doing the exact same activities all over again would most definitely make students bored, and maybe you also. Remember, boredom is our nemesis. So try to do several different tasks with a selection of different topics to keep students at all levels interested. Balancing. Well, after all that I've said, I should mention that variety is not the same as anarchy. Remember, I stated a little bit of unpredictability. So, despite what I explain in this section, Students tend to like a certain amount of predictability, since they appreciate a safe structure that they can rely on. So, deviating too much from your way of teaching and adding too much variety in the lesson might be destabilizing. Again, balance is the key. You gotta find a sweet spot between being predictable and having something unexpected an unexpected variety. Well, 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 we hit the fifth section, the last one. Following a prearranged plan. Uh, preparing a lesson plan and sticking to it is one of our many duties as a teacher, which make up for an important segment of a class period. But there may be times in which we have to deviate from or completely abandon our prearranged plans. Let's dive into the section then. The unforeseeable. These are the events that might lead you to abandon your plan or modify it in a court. Let's see what they are. First one is while doing an activity more time than planned might be needed. Obviously, 
more time must be allocated to let students finish the exercise. And doing so, some of the other activities in the pre-arranged plan might have to be shortened, modified, or completely abolished. Second one is students might find the current activity helpful, enjoyable, and that's why I continue. What will you do? There are two paths open for you to take. You either continue the activity a bit more and go along with the student's wishes, or you just proceed ahead regardless. Fourth one is some students might finish the activities much earlier than planned. Then the teacher can either stop the rest of the class and frustrate them, which is unlikely, or more logically, assign the finished students some quick useful task which they can do while waiting. Other unforeseeable events include the following, the smart board might suddenly not work, teacher might have forgotten to bring the material, students might have already done the planned activity, and you gotta find relevant solutions to all these problems and the like. Flexibility is what helps you overcome those types of situations. Being flexible when the class is taking place is a vital teacher skill. A balance should be struck between teachers attempting to achieve what they plan to achieve on the one hand and responding to student wishes or doings on the other. So good teachers are sufficiently flexible to deal with such problems that I gave here. As they are focused on the students and what they need, good teachers can quickly react to the unforeseeable events. They are those that know their plans are only prototypes to help them to shape an outline and they may have to abandon parts or all of them in accordance with how the class is going. Therefore, good teachers are those who are flexible. Well, yay, wrap up. As you can see from the faces of these little kids. All right, as I wrap up, I wanted to summarize the whole presentation in bullet points to briefly generalize the characteristics of a good teacher, especially good language teachers. So, a good teacher is someone who loves the job they're doing, enjoys teaching, and does their best to keep their students interested, uses the full range of their personality, shows their true self and is always sincere, adjusts their languages in compliance with the levels of their students, and provides comprehensible input that is in students' son of proximal development, uses a clear, comprehensible, and well-structured language all the time, specifically while giving instructions, knows the advantages of TTT and STT. TTT is language acquisition, STT is practicing in target language. Allows their students to practice the language freely in a safe classroom environment. Stays in a sweet spot between predictability and surprise to balance both. And can be flexible to whatever happens in the class even while attempting to follow their pre-arranged lesson plans. Here are the textual references of which we have made use, and here are the visual references that we have used to embellish our presentation. Well, this is all we have, which I have presented to you. I hope we could make it right and easy for everyone to understand the topic, and that you've enjoyed the presentation. I thank you for watching and I wish all of you to have a lovely, healthy and a great day. Bye for now.